this vortex ring donut thing that is written about. That's, that's somebody's myth. So just chuck that one out. <clears throat> Thermal columns, yes, but even, even uh, a, a well-organized thermal is typically not this beautiful column. It's very chaotic and disorganized. So <clears throat> try not to put thermals in, in forms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you take it as you find it. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it's a, this is, I think this article was written by Wayne Angevine in uh, Midwest, and uh, it's, it, it's an interesting document to go read through if you want to actually get a visual of uh, you know, what a thermal might look like. <clears throat> There's a whole bunch of things that influence thermals, humidity, ground moisture, uh, lax rate, we talked a little bit about the temperature profile. I've talked a lot about inversion height, uh, clouds at altitude, you know, how much heat is made into the ground. So lots of different things that influence thermals. Uh, the most important thing to really get in your head is thermals start from warm air near the ground. And then what, the, what does that mean? The thermal ends up being a vacuum cleaner. So you've got this thermal that's got air going up. It, the air near the ground has to come from air around it. So <clears throat> if there's zero wind and there's a thermal in the middle of the field, the flags around the field are all pointing into the thermal. And understanding that is more important to anything else. The thermal does drift with the wind. And <clears throat> There's, there's some influences on when there's a wind change with altitude, then, then the thermal will go up and get bent over, and then eventually the top gets sheared off, and you find that the thermal has reformed upwind. So if you're circling, and then all of a sudden the thermal's decayed, sometimes you just move upwind, bam, there it is. So when there's wind, you'll find that the thermal is adjusting upwind with time just because the source near the ground isn't moving as fast as the air at altitude. And then uh, a corollary to that, and I'll talk about that in a minute, is that when there's wind, the thermals tend to organize into corridors. So you got a, a, a lift corridor and a sink corridor, and the best way to find a thermal when there's wind is to go crosswind and find the corridor, point it to the wind. You can just surf the light air and then bam, there's a good part, you go to. And then <clears throat> thermals coalesce. In other words, you get two thermals near the uh, near each other up and they'll they'll get sucked to each other and make a bigger thermal. So uh, so thermals are attracted to each other, they like each other. The thermal aspect ratio, how how wide is the thermal compared to how high? And Different days uh, have different thermal aspect ratios, but uh, the big picture is uh, you know, the the lift area is probably two to three part. Uh, uh, the thermal height tends to be about two to three times as uh, uh, much as the thermal width. For us in the RC and in the modeling industry, we're working down near the bottom of the big lift cycle. So we'll have an area where there's a lots of little thermals from our perspective, and then there'll be a sink cycle where there's just no very little lift. But that lift cycle at altitude, those thermals coalesce and turn into the big thermal, and that's, that's where I'm talking about the uh, uh, therm big thermal diameter. So we refer the ratio to the largest part of the thermal. Right, the, the whole lift area, and you know, what we're doing is working the little little bits inside. Uh, the full scale guys, uh, although in the morning when the inversion height is low, then the aspect ratio is a little bit more accurate. So is the width of the the largest width? Yeah. <clears throat> Talked a little bit about the, uh, what's going on at the top of the inversion. Uh, so yeah. But the big, the most important thing is that number one bullet. Near the bottom of the thermal, gear is getting pulled in. 
Joe, you talked about uh, stages of uh, thermal. Yes. So it's uh, baby thermal, uh, teenagers, sort of, sort of uh, thermal, and eldest thermal, and then she dies. Right. So yeah, you've got the you know the teenager, vigorous, young thermal that's still disorganized, but lots of energy. Mature, the air's nice and smooth, and everything's nice and working. The geriatric thermal, and she's beginning to run out of energy, breaking down. And yeah, what flying your model? Can you say within a thermal which stage the thermal is? Most of the time you, you get cues or clues. Uh, you know, when when the air's when when the thermal's young and vigorous, you've got lots of energy, big lift, big sink, lots of turbulence because it, it hasn't quite organized. And then once it's organized and you know, the air is nice and smooth and it's going. The geriatric thermal is gentle, but it's just lost its own fin and it's got holes in it, but it's not really turbulent holes. It's just it's just running out of steam and, uh, and then, uh, the, the best example of that that I could think of for flying was uh, 2010 World Champs for F3J, the fly-offs in the morning that they had, and we're launching at 8.30 in the morning in France, and we're driving to the field, and the hotel we're at was maybe uh, you know, 60 meters elevation compared to the surrounding valley, and you could see the immersion height you know, 50 meters up from the ground. So you, know, you could just see this haze there, it's only 50 meters high. <clears throat> and at 8.30 in the morning, first launch, and the first bubbles were going up and hitting this 50 meters altitude. And so you get a thermal, that's only 10 meters wide, 15 meters wide, just big enough to work. And the thermal went from <clears throat> teenager to geriatric in about three or four minutes. So it, it, the air near the, near the ground, uh, only 10 meters up, gets warmed up, starts the thermal, and it, it goes and it's pulling air from around it and eventually it's exhausted all the air around it and the thermal you know, basically got cut off at the knees and runs out of poop. And so you, there's, there's one, it's going, it's going, it's going. And you're sitting there battling it out and then it's uh, time to find another one. <clears throat> so you can tell readily whether you're in a, you know, a young vigorous thermal or an old thermal. And uh, you know, but the cool part is there's a thermal every 100 meters. So all you had to do was hop from bubble to bubble to bubble and for the 15 minute flight. But what you're really trying to figure out is how to feel the air getting pulled into a thermal. When there's no net wind, you know that any wind you feel is going towards a thermal or away from the sink. So you go downwind of what you feel.